Hello my friends, welcome on Green World in a Pod, I'm Tanya Gervais. My guest today is Jessica Lewis, who's a friend of mine. Uh, we met when I was living in New York. She's Canadian um, and uh, a wild soul. <laughs> I think that's why we connected super well. She's a mom, an ex-model, um, a producer of Straight Curve Film. Um, she's a soon-to-be farmer <laughs> and overall a, a strong woman who's in constant evolution and it's... It's amazing, and the, I'm now thinking of how to present her, and there's no better way to say she's a whole powerful, strong woman, very creative, um, amazing friend and mom. <laughs> so today I want to discuss with her, um, well, we, we recorded this episode before, but I'm presenting it to you today. Um, we discuss modeling 20 years ago versus today because she is the only model I know um, who's also a friend of mine <laughs> who started modeling when she was very young and before social media, before any, before the digital age. So basically, you would have Polaroids that were um, real Polaroids uh, with the Polaroid camera. A uh, lighting check was done with a Polaroid. Um, everything was shot in film. Um, <laughs> you would not have City Mapper on your phone nor Google Maps, but you had an A to Z or a real like City Map. You would call from the the public phone, your agency, and you would go into your agency to have your casting sheet um, printed um, in the morning. And you would call your agency, you would not email, and it, it's, uh, it was something else. And we talk about that and how modeling changed and what this change brought upon both the models but also the entire creative industry and how how creativity has suffered from the digital digital age and social media and Instagram and um, I was thinking about because I asked Jessica what she misses the most from those times or what she misses from modeling and I don't think I answered to this question but I kept it in my head until one day I realized um, so now I don't model anymore and I was thinking what is why do I have sometimes bursts of will to want to go back to modeling and I realized that what I miss is the frozen time of modeling. And I literally live modeling. Um, I, I literally live, pardon me, um, time much more, I would say. Like I feel the time passing. I see it on, on my face, on my body. And when I was a model, I did not perceive time passing. Perhaps because, of course, my image was always... Um, myself, my image was always frozen in, an, in a photograph. So it's definitely this whole... It's really a process for me to, to deal with time, to befriend time. <laughs> And I think perhaps as a society, we do not befriend time. And 
And that's why we live so much perhaps on Instagram today. Um, I don't know. It's just a, just a thought. Um, or we look at ourselves more on a photograph than in a mirror. Who knows? We we all have our our um, our own relationship with ourselves. But for me, time is a big one. And seeing how I I lived in a frozen time for twenty years because modeling really when you start, and if you look at the supermodels, um, they have not changed that much. Um, if they have a signature haircut, that haircut stays for 10, 20 years. Maybe they change it once, um, but it's that signature look that they have and it gets frozen. Their bodies are frozen. You give birth and you have to go back to what you were before. And there's never an after or there's never a real public after. And this is what I'm living now as I observe myself and my life after 20 years of modeling how how my relationship even to photos changed um, I don't I would like to be photographed but and at the same time I just feel a bit of a resistance in, in seeing myself in a photograph or having a photo taken um, I'm, uh, I, I, I do observe more of myself in the mirror. I observe my face, the new wrinkles. Um, yeah, a lot of things. Um, a lot of things that a camera cannot capture, or I, I think it cannot capture. And those are precious things that you can only know when you slow down, when you live every moment. Um, I just wanted to share that with you. Perhaps somebody may relate. Perhaps it's not just uh, about modeling, uh, but I definitely, uh, this is what I take from modeling. And so, yeah. <laughs> I hope you enjoy our our talk. It's not edited as everything in this podcast. And um, I actually really enjoyed this chat with her because it brought good memories, laughs, and um, a, a perspective, a change of perspective on inclusivity, exclusivity, um, creativity where is this going um so enjoy it hello and we're here on green world in a pod with jess lewis welcome hey <laughs> um so jess is uh currently a mom um was a model, is a producer, um, going to be a farmer. I'm, I'm trying to think of all the things that uh, you define you. All of the titles. All of the titles. Yeah, I mean, a constant, like everyone else in these COVID times, like constant evolution. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, with Jess today, we're going to discuss... Um, something that I've been wanting to talk to her about for a while. And so Jess and I have in common the fact that we've been modeling for 20 years. That means starting in the early 2000s and modeling was completely, completely different. I remember I was modeling in mm -hmm. Milan back then. I was 12, 13, mm -hmm. 12, um, starting and I actually never moved from Milan. Like I always modeled in Milan when I was that young. Um, I only moved to New York after I graduated from university. And that's when I met Jess. 
but Jess experience has been uh, a, a full full modeling experience and I would like to start from there yeah yeah absolutely so um I started modeling well I first got signed in what was it 99 um 99 I was 14 I think I believe um and I started where where I was where I was born and from Canada Toronto um and as as you said at the time the industry was completely different there was no social media um there was uh like <laughs> Even even things like emails were still not very much the norm. Um, digital uh, was not the norm. Everything was still on, you know, Polaroid or film. Uh, everything from, you know, magazines, publications was all still hard copy paper. Um, so, you know, by virtue of that, the industry was still very um, enclosed and cut off from the general public. Um, and also the general public didn't really have the opportunity that they do these days to, um, be giving their opinions on the content that the industry was producing. It was kind of like, okay, this is what it is. This is what fashion is. And that's it. Um, so I mean, after I, after my first year of modeling in Canada and kind of getting, uh, uh, developing my book, I moved to New York city when I was 15 um i signed with img models uh which was great um and i started doing shows right away i just do dove right into doing show season i had a great first season um in new york city i i want to say i'm trying to think when when alexander wang wa launched but that was like early 2000 for nurse walk way back on his first show but um from there i started doing this show circuits uh internationally so we would do new york london milan paris um and then after show season we would you know shoot some editorial um do some commercial bread and butter jobs in um Spain and Germany um, and other European markets. Uh, and then we would start all over again in New York the next season. Um, so that continued for probably seven years that way. Um, and then I started getting a little bit more downtime um, after the uh, shows at the beginning of the year. Um, and I started doing a few more Asian contracts. So I would go from like maybe May through to August, um, because show castings would start, uh, would start at the end of August, the last two weeks of August in New York city. Um, and I would go on contract for like two or three months in Asia. Um, and you know, that's obviously like its own kettle of fish still to this day. I think like the Asian market is like its own entity. It operates completely on, you know, with the exception of a few major international publications um, that have that have reached there um, or that have outlets there. Um, yeah, I mean, the Asian market was definitely something different. It was always really fun for me, though. Um, you know, I loved like at that t at, by that time I'd been rooming with uh, with girls and young women from all over the world. And that was always amazing for me. Um, and then after that, I started to get a little bit tired of the industry. I started to, by this time, social media was starting to kick in a little bit. It was in its infancy. So there was no Instagram yet, but there was definitely Facebook. Um, and digital had really started to pick up a little bit. Um, and in turn, so had like communication amongst agents and clients through email. Um, so uh, I, I just, I don't know, something wasn't sitting right about the industry. At this time, I was probably approaching my mid 20s. And I think that I was actually, I was actually tired of the constant dieting that I was doing. 
um, I felt like I was like having a battle with my body because, you know, bear in mind, I had started probably 10 years plus ago at this point. And um, I was trying to maintain that same body, which I was doing successfully, but um, I didn't feel like completely healthy um, in my body, which was starting to seep into my mind. Um, and so I said, even though I had a full chart of bookings, I said to my agent's horror, my mother agent's horror, that um, I was going to take a year off of modeling. Uh, I wanted to take some time completely to myself and, um, uh, and, uh, that was not received well by any of my agencies internationally, but, um, I, I really, I really felt like I needed to stay true to my values, my morals and my own journey outside of mm. my, my label, my title of model, um, you know coming back to like what we were talking about earlier with self-respect. So, um, I did that. I, um, I started eating three square meals a, get, a day again and, um, exercising and, you know, doing, doing things that made, made me feel fantastic, uh, as far as, you know, exercise is concerned, yoga, bike, like long distance biking, long distance running. Um, weightlifting, all of this. So, uh, that's also the year that I walked a few big trails, one of which was the Camino Santiago, um, which was fantastic. Uh, so I came back to Canada and I ran into an agent of mine and said, Jess, you look really great. Your body looks fantastic. Have you considered plus size modeling? And this was the first time I've ever heard of plus size modeling. And of course, the, the way that I'd been brought up in the industry, mm -hmm. um, this was like, like, quel horror, like, oh my God, like <laughs> what? Um, uh, plus size modeling at, at, at the time it was proposed to me was not like something that was on the up and up in any European market, really. Um, even the UK market was still like, was still in its very, very infancy. Um, so she, she told me, you know, she went on to tell me, listen, something, something big is really happening, um, as far as, uh, diversifying the industry, um, in New York. And, uh, she said, I think that, I think that we should sign you there and, and, and explore that. So we did that. And, um, that was really a huge game changer for me. I started meeting, like, I remember my first few trips to New York before I actually moved down there to model as a curve model. Um, I met women like Denise Bido. Um, who else did I meet? Um, Ashley Graham. Candace Hufine, Robin Lawley, and these women were so empowered and confident in their bodies. I was empowered, confident in their bodies. That wasn't their, like, what was traditional with so many straight size models. Their brand didn't just end at their bodies, their brand expanded into their reality. Um, their, their, uh, their belief system, their whole philosophy on not just the fashion industry, but life and how a woman can happily live her life at any size, um, was like very profound for me. <laughs> so, um, that happened and I really liked that. I really liked the way that like these women were making me feel and this whole rhetoric and like, um, it was kind of opening some new thought processes for me. And I really was like beyond being a model was keen to explore that. So I moved to New York city and, you know, started curve modeling and um, that was great for me. Uh, at the time, I think there were like two clients in, in Italy, Elena Moreau and Marina Rinaldi. <laughs> and so I worked for those clients for a little while and to a number of clients in the German market. Um, and that was great for, for a few years. Um, although again, I started to get amongst all of the excitement of, um, 
diversity starting to seep into other markets and uh, really uh, other conversations and societies surrounding inclusivity, equality, et cetera, et cetera, um, you know, as far as pertaining to ethnicity, um, not just not just body size, but, you know, the broad scope. Um, I started to get kind of discontent with being just a model. Like I didn't want to, I, I, I was feeling very restrained, um, almost like how I was as a straight size model. Mm-hmm. So I wanted to do, I wanted to do more, like I was also doing a lot of interviews at the time uh, for various publications, talking about my journey from a straight size model to a curve model. Um, and that's when I, I got approached with the opportunity for, uh, for Straight Curve by a former, former journalist, Jenny McQuayle, turned documentary filmmaker. And uh, yeah, that was, that was a solid three, four year journey um, in and of itself <laughs> that you know all about, um, you know, and had very successful premieres and also uh, made its way once we premiered um in in new york city we went on to premiere in canada and in the uk and um, australia um and uh after that you know we did a lot in education um which was great and um that was kind of my my you know in retrospect like that was kind of my grand finale in the industry as it was like the industry that i grew up in um and that that I that I uh, the connection is a bit and then everything just really uh social media you know just like took a hold of everything and um completely changed the like I think agencies really started to not just agencies but brands um publications really started to realize that they weren't in the in the seat anymore they weren't in the driver's seat they had to start catering to public demand um they either had to do that or die and that's just been a game changer that's kind of like where we're at right now um i think that uh, the catering on demand killed a bit of creative genius absolutely absolutely i mean listen you'll talk to you can, I th I'm, I'm 100% sure that you can talk to any model who started in the early 2000s or even the 90s and they'll tell you that, you know, because, because so many brands and publications are operating off of public demand right now, the strategy is very rigid. The marketing and the strategy behind whatever you're shooting has very rigid kind of like restraints in place. There's very rarely time left for like, you know, or wiggle room left for creativity and like sporadic, these sporadic moments of genius that just happen on set. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's very rare now that you come onto set and all there is like, I even remember going onto sets, shooting for big editorials for, you know, L or, or W Magazine or whatever. And there wouldn't even be a mood board. There would be wardrobe and there would be hair and makeup. And there would be a set number of images that they were trying to find, like finals that they were trying to create for the story. But there was no mood mood board. There was like this is the 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 clothing and the makeup was the mood, and we came up with that on set, and then we shot. Um, <laughs> so you know, it's it's uh, yeah, it's definitely killed some some creativity. Um, you know, I hope like I hope that comes back. And um, because I think right for a lot of the people who social media prior to you know 2020 where we are right now um are like are not only are, are well yeah are missing that um because it wasn't it wasn't just you know the creativity it acted as a source of inspiration and drive for so many of us 
um, that, you know, it's, it's almost like everything has become commercialized. Whereas before you used to have very defined categories mm -hmm. of commercial yeah. work and editorial work and runway work and commercial work. Everyone knew had the mood board, had the shots, had the poses. And that was it. It was very rigid kind of get her done. Um, editorial never used to be like that, but now, I mean, the lines of editorial are so blurred. People are creating their own content at home, um, based on, uh, brand specifications. Like, you know, you see brand partnerships all the time, um, being run by various publications through social media. And um, the content creator is given very specific, specific, you know, like requirements that they need to fill and that's it. Then they run this story. Um, and a lot of the time it's like self-shot as well. Um, yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely missing, especially with all the time that I spent in my career in, in Europe um, and in the UK, definitely missing the the creative outlet. I think that's a huge one for me. That's like kind of keeping me, you know, away from the industry right now. Like a number of people ask me since I've had kids after the documentary, are you going to come back to the industry? What are you doing? Et cetera, et cetera. And honestly, this isn't, this, indus this isn't the industry I grew up in and it's not really an industry that inspires me yeah. uh, the way it used to right now. Um, while it is exciting with diversity um, happening, I think that people are so distracted with figuring out what the strategy is to incorporate diversity into the brand or into the publication that they're missing the creativity element. Yeah. I'm glad you said this. And also they just, uh, sometimes they just want to take, uh, I've been thinking about this diversity and um, um, what it means. Uh, actually now it's changing, but before what I was noticing is that whatever I felt I perceived as um, beautiful, but was, let's say, non-white, non-Caucasic, um, mm -hmm. I still believe that whatever my eye was perceiving as beautiful yet was dark skinned, um, was not diverse because I could still read her beauty in my own terms. And it's when I was looking at the Victoria's Secret before now they changed the whole like branding and strategy, but I was like, oh, cool. Yeah, they can say they're diverse. They have uh, Asian girls, uh, African girls, Russians, uh, South American, whatever. But I was like, but they all have the same body. <laughs> like they all have, mm -hmm. the same mm -hmm. they all have to, the, the, the women who are naturally more curvaceous, they just have to freaking shrink. Yeah. Where is the diversity in that? Uh, yeah, absolutely. A different color palette, but it it says nothing. So I always wonder. I am wondering if diversity really means challenging in a way. The whatever you see and perceive as beautiful is not really diverse because it doesn't challenge your 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 perception and your beauty perception. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, again, I think a lot of that leads back to like the industry. Some of these, these corporate umbrella brands are so huge and their, their, um, their marketing strategies when it comes to incorporating something that is new, um, and doing so successfully are, like I said, they're so, they're so rigid and it's almost like they can only do a little bit at a time and they're really focused on the numbers. How is our, our, um, customer going to respond to this? Let's try this for a few seasons and only this. So let's try, let's try, you know, racial diversity for a few seasons and see how that works. Um, 
uh, so that's been, that's, I find that that's kind of been Victoria's secret strategy. I mean, they've been doing a number of Kerr partnerships. I shouldn't say a number. They've been doing like a handful of them. Um, many of them are like social media, um, heavy or social media kind of like based, um, like, you know, I think, what was it a few seasons ago or no, two seasons ago, was it Allie Tate was in a, a handful of stores. Um, I mean, it's so like, <laughs> it's so minimal. And they did the big PR around that, that you have to ask, like, is the brand really dedicated to this or is this yeah. a PR strategy? Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, one thing that I will say, I actually, um, took the time to watch, to watch, um, Rihanna's, uh, Fenty show on Amazon prime. Have you seen it? Uh, I stopped after 10 minutes because I, Honestly, I don't like it. Uh, to me, I, I don't like, for me, it's a high level of vulgarity. There is, uh, so for my taste, it's, uh, it's a no. I went yeah. to search also um, her brand and how, I don't know, I wanted to see if, uh, if it was sustainable, if uh, what it is, what it does it stand for, and things like that. And I was just like, her bras cost fifteen dollars. How? Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's where, yeah. It's like it's like Victoria's Secret. Thing? Well, so this is the thing. So you know, it's like yes, they're being feel, diverse. You know, it's bad to say it, but what I feel is that she took the great opportunity. Victoria's Secret was having huge issues because they just refused to put any curve model and she launches this this uh, lingerie uh, pr same price almost as Victoria's Secret and markets it in the same way as Victoria's Secret mm -hmm. putting diversity yep and of course the public yeah. is like oh yeah and but absolutely. I'm, I'm not a fan. I'm absolutely. I mean, I think that I think the show is very representative of um American culture. Um definitely. Uh and you know, it's interesting because the Fenty brand is what umbrella are they under? I feel like they're under LVMH or yeah. Curring. Yeah, yeah. Curring. Um, so, you know, I have to wonder how much of this is like, is, is something that's here to stay or I mean, authentic, how much of it is like them using Rihanna as a figurehead? Because we all know that these umbrellas, the executives who sit on the board there are all old white Europeans, very wealthy, old white Europeans. <laughs> With the exception of a few like daughters of the old white Europeans who can no longer sit on the board. <laughs> um, so I'm kind of like, how much of this is authentic um, versus using Rihanna as the brand figurehead? Um, almost like what happened with, um, what's his name? Off-White um, and Louis Vuitton. Um, what's his name? That designer. Um, God, it's, it's totally, it's totally escaping me right now. Uh, starts with an A. I don't know. Listen, same story. They use like a person of color as a figurehead for this like old white European brand. Um, you know, so I'm wondering like how much, no. like how much, um, like, obviously, they gave her creative freedom. But yes, I mean, then there's the issue of, you know, sustainability and basically uh, Fenty using Virgil Abloh is the, the name of that designer. Um, same story. Same story. Uh, so, you know, I wonder how much of that is like, 
going to stay around? <laughs> um, how much of it was like kind of a trial for the umbrella that the brand falls under? Um, how much of it is like them satiating public demand, which they're getting through social media? And would they have tried this if social media had not existed? Mm -hmm. um, the answer is probably not. <laughs> you know, the, the, they're, they're purely operating on public demand, which is fine. That's what, uh, that's what brands do. But, you know, as far as it being like what a projectile that's going to lead into something else, I don't what know. Do you think about, I uh, don't know how to put it, but um, educating the public to a creative eye or um, to the taste. You <laughs> have taste. I mean, as far as like beauty aesthetic, I mean, listen, beauty aesthetic when it comes to our society is not something that changes over the course of five years, 10 years, 30 years, 100 years. Um, our current aesthetic has been established for centuries, centuries prior to where we're at right now. So, um, I mean, I, I do think to a certain extent that we have been trained to, um, prefer a certain aesthetic namely a slim Caucasian one, um, you know, but like, <laughs> let's dive into the rabbit hole here of why, why that, why that is and who has been, um, reinforcing those ideals for centuries. Um, you know, it's, uh, and it's especially hard to say that I'm because I'm so living in American culture as I am. I'm so inundated with um, these movements and the hope behind them that, you know, this is going to be a pinnacle point for change for the industry. Um, you know, but then coming from the family that I, I was raised in, which is a, a, a British crown family, um, you know, I'm, I'm not naive to the fact that like <laughs> the, the, um, the, the, not just the patriarchy, but you know, the colonial, um, not just colonial, but almost like the, the white, the Caucasian influence is very powerful and very strong in many of the leading markets globally. So I think it's just, it's, you know, it's a waiting game. Like we have to see, you know, like, let's, let's, let's come back to, I almost want to say, like, let's come back to years and see if, you know, this was, I think it's still too early to tell if we'll be, uh, 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 you know, the starting line for a new aesthetic or if, you know, the majority of brands, which are sadly run by, um, by Caucasian entities, um, will, will, uh, will like, if that will fall to the background or if this will be a trend or if it will be like a lasting, a lasting, um, aesthetic. I don't know. <sighs> you know, it's hard. It's hard to answer. It's such a complex question. Um, Lex, because yeah. the, I mean, maybe I find incredible what happened this past September, because for the first time you saw Versace put, uh, yep. and I mean, that is such a brand that it's, it's really, it has always been such an exclusive brand of, you know, just the most fierce supermodels most you know like they had a mm -hmm. line and they got three three super curve models and yep and i think well we have to see what happens but um 
it sends a really powerful message to and it shouldn't but it, it does that you know you are worthy of feeling this way feeling so fierce feeling so powerful feeling you know with my clothes or you're worthy of my clothes or my brand and right. And, and I was like, whoa, like that is a, it, uh, it's right. So now anger. is this, is this a brand responding to public demand and trends or is this going to be the beginning of lasting change? I mean, it's hard it's hard because I, I talked to, uh, I was talking to actually one of my very good friends for many years now, who's a uh, part owner in an agency in Paris that shall remain unnamed. Um, he's, uh, he's a person of color. And um, I remember a few years ago, he, like he came Paris, of course, as we in the industry all know is very, um, dedicated to their size zero to um, Caucasian woman aesthetic. Many of the fashion houses there have refused to budge on that um, unless it's like th in the case of tokenism. Um, and so I was talking to my friend um, and I told him this probably like, I don't know, what was it? Six or seven years ago, I said, listen, you should bring some curve girls on your board. And, um, he was like, no, no, there's never going to be any demand for that. And, um, and I was like, okay, well, you know, I guess we'll see. So this past season, he had two curve girls. He only has, he brought on, he ended up bringing four curve girls in the interim on his board. And he had one of them walk for, um, erased. And I told him, I said, you see, and he goes, he still says, yeah, but you know what? I think this is just a trend. Many, uh, you know, it's not the first time that I hear it because from the industry insiders, uh, it is said that it is a trend mm -hmm. at the moment. We're also facing, um, besides the pandemic, but globally, <laughs> there's a big discontent. And, and the public and women are also pretty, I don't know, unhappy and trying to um, be empowered, get empowered, you know, and the way they can do it also, it's uh, through social media and uh, demand mm -hmm. they want in large numbers mm -hmm. um but you know i'm it's unfortunate because i'm not doing my documentary anymore um for various reasons but one of the things that i wanted to and i will say it here but i was um researching is uh and i had a great interview that i wanted to have with the someone oh, i can't remember her name but there's a wonderful book i will send you the name and i will um post in my social media of green world in a pod she says that women are actually are happy for the breadcrumbs they they don't really demand and if you observe the way we're talking about this is is this just because they want us to, to make us happy or is it real and women don't even question it. They just accept whichever breadcrumb the fashion industry gives them. And, and in a way, the, 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 the norm, like the, the, the norm, the beauty norm, um, is just there patiently waiting. Um, it did not stop working. Um, but it's there, like it's gonna yep. come and the rest is gonna be sort of pushed back because I mean, we're talking about this change for what, the past 15 years almost? Yep, yep. Like, we're still here talking about it for fuck's sake. Like, it's really interesting because, you know, when the pandemic hit, a number of umbrella, smaller umbrella brands 
or smaller umbrella corporations, um, the first brand out of their um, profile that they cut was the Curve one. And um, I mean, to me, that's shocking because I would think that by now um, the numbers, like the profit that a brand has, the profit potential that a brand has um, when catering to the Curve community is is pretty phenomenal. Um, although many people would argue that that really only applies to markets like the US and the UK um, and not Europe and not Asia um, and not even South America. Um, so <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it, it like- loves the sexy doll. I mean, um, skinny, sexy doll, Italy, Italian market. Like yeah. they, they, they still, they just uh, love that. It's, uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> it doesn't matter that the population in Italy is, you know, curvier naturally, uh, mm -hmm. but the, the aesthetic in media is mm -hmm. not changing. It's still, yeah, it's still largely that. Yeah, I know. Um, I think we take for granted whatever we hear in social media that is happening all over the world. And the reality is that it's mostly happening in America with the Americans. Um, and, oh, I see Pamela Anderson on the roof. Pamela Anderson. Crawling all over the car. Is her cat, by the way. <laughs> yeah. Pamela, just a cat no. life. Casual Pamela Anderson crawling on my roof. Um, um, so my question is, do you think fashion should be inclusive or exclusive? I'm divided because I sort I mean, of I, and loved the 90s, um, even for the exclusivity. Um, I mean, that's, that's the thing is that the fashion industry in the 90s, the fashion industry, you take away... You take away social media and it's a whole different ball game. Um, when you're not getting feedback from, you know, quote unquote, like real, real people, um, the brands aren't motivated to do anything outside of what their creative team, which is usually a team of like, what, you know, anywhere between five and 10 people, um, dream up. Yeah. And that's it. So. I mean, it's, it's, it's hard to say like one way or the other, it, it, should fashion be inclusive? Should it be exclusive? Um, I mean, I think particularly at this point in time with taking into, into, you know, account the reality, which is that social media is a part, a big part of our lives. Um, fashion is, uh, <laughs> it's, uh, now, let me think about how I want to word this. Um, it's it, it it's very political um, right now. I think that there probably hasn't been a time where the industry has been quite so political on such a prominent platform. I mean, of course, if anyone like knows fashion fashion history, we can go back and look at some of the major fashion houses and the role that they played in uh, World War II or Nazi Europe or whatever. Um, but um, when we're talking about you know uh, fashion and politics and the intersection of that um, in manifested in social media. Um, I think anyone, you know, would be very hard pressed to um, step so far away from reality and say that fashion should be exclusive because it's just not even, it's like, I venture to say, it's not even a reality anymore. It's like mandatory that fashion be inclusive. You're not ever going to launch a brand successfully. Um, you know, when you're being, when you're excluding any one group of people, because you'll just get slaughtered before you even get off the, I mean, unless you have no intention of using social media, 
um, or any, you know, uh, marketing tools that brands these days use, um, there, there's no way that you could even, I mean, if you look at all of the brands, I'm trying to think of a brand who's still maintaining like, uh, quote unquote exclusivity or a very small demographic. That's the thing is that, you know, you would have to go into it knowingly and accept. Hedy Sliman is. Yes. Yes. Well, yes, but these are, these are the major fashion houses and like, the reality is that they have the financial backing to do whatever, whatever they're going to do. Um, and they'll keep, they'll keep functioning as they wish. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think, I think anyone would be hard pressed to say that fashion shouldn't be inclusive. Um, this day, this, this day and age, it's just, it's so readily available to, so many demographics all over the world and it's become such a so many brands have morphed into not just being the fashion of it but you know a political force whether it's for you know Mm -hmm. women's rights gender equality you know equal the broad scope of equality um you know, whatever, whatever their cause is, like, that's been another ongoing trend now is that so many brands are, are aligning themselves with a political rhetoric in one way or another. So, um, yeah, I think, I think that you, you would be very hard pressed to not, to not say that it should be inclusive. What, what? I think that anyone would be very hard pressed to not say that, you know, fashion should be inclusive right now at this moment in time. Yeah, it's. uh... There's just, there's no, there's no space unless you're like a very old fashion house who's just, you know, doing their own thing, um, you know, with, without any account for what the general public or society or, um, thinks of it you you're 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 going to be inclusive it's almost inevitable Mm -hmm. (laughs) ah yeah uh well it's hard to say i'm just i just it's hard to say i mean you know that that being said like (laughs) Fashion's moving a mile a minute now. Who knows? Who knows where it's going to be in five years? Who knows where it's going to be in 10 years? Like, we don't know. I mean, I saw that, that like so many people are experimenting. There's a number of brands that are experimenting now. Like who was it? Olivier at Balmain Mm -hmm. and his, um, his like robot show, his like virtual robot show. Yeah. Um, I thought it was awful. Like, to me, the notion of using robots as models is insane. Mm-hmm. Um, like the part of the excitement of a brand is like a model bringing their personality to it. That's what makes me excited about a brand is when they have a really great model um, with a really, you know, fantastic, like punchy personality um, delivering the, you know, know the brand aesthetic yeah uh, as it may be um so for me that show was fucking awful but if you go through the comments on their social media there are so many people you know whether or not they've got their nose stuck in olivier's bum remains to be seen but there are so many people um who are like oh this is amazing this is revolutionary um (laughs) You know, and what does like, what do, so then we, we we go and we go down the, the road of, are robots really inclusive? Do robots represent inclusivity at all? Could they ever in any world represent inclusivity? Should they? My, you know, my, um, my fear is that. Robots, if they get established, 
um, and you start seeing them and how perfect they are. Actually, what I find silly is that they try to make them a bit less perfect, certain robots. And I was like, how, where is this madness? Like we women are photoshopped to be completely flawless. And then the robots are being built to be as real as possible. Yeah. What? Um, but you're never, you're never going to get like cellulite stretch marks. No. Um, any of this on at least not that I forecast in my lifetime um, on a robot. And these are defining you know, human, Jeff, Jesus Christ. Oh, sorry. Can you take that out? Fuck. <laughs> My husband. Um, um, these are, you know, defining human features. And like, I love to see stretch marks or cellulite or even like skin blemishes on any human. I don't give a shit what size they are, what, you know, what race they are. That's, that's something for me that is a huge point of relation. And I think this is something that was so alien about, uh, the Balma show, Olivia's Balma show. This was probably like two seasons ago. Um, you know, that like, that, uh, that there was just like no point of resignation or, um, that I could see myself in at all, at all, you know? So like, even with, even if you, you stock your, your, so say, let's take uh, Rihanna's, um, Fenty show, for example, even if your cast is majority women of color who are curvy, which I am not right now curvy or ever was a woman of color. Um, I still see things that will you know, resonate with me. Like I still see the stretch marks. I still see the skin blemishes. I still see how their body like moves in a human way. Mm -hmm. And that's still, regardless of the cast is something that, um, will always resonate with me. So, you know, when I see these insane robot shows and then even further to that people endorsing it and saying it's amazing and revolutionary, <laughs> It makes me first check my age and be like, oh my God, like, am I that old fashioned <laughs> that, that I think like the, the, the thought of having, you know, a human being as a model, like, is that going to become something that's like, quote unquote, old fashioned in the next 20 years or 30 years or whatever it is? <laughs> I don't know, but um, I think the same way, but there's a nice episode uh, on Green World in a Pod, and I interviewed uh, Francesca of, she's the founder and agent of Special Beauties in Milan, and her take, she loves fashion also because of its constant evolution, and she doesn't dislike robots. She has a nice way or her view on robots um mm -hmm. but i i'm just uh you know what i think is that the more we see for example the kardashians on the phone and all mm -hmm. their uh the way they're they're <laughs> redone and mm -hmm. the mania of young girls wanting to redo their whole face to look like that i'm wondering if <laughs> If robots will be the, like the Kardashians, I know it's like, it takes time, but you know, we humans never, we create things and then we never question what could be the potential impact of these things in, let's say 10 years. Right. And I always question what could be, maybe not, but what could be a negative effect on it. Right. Or the fact that you don't recognize anymore the expressions or, I don't know. For me, fashion is so, it, it cannot be detached from the human expression. Right. That, that it's just uh, to have a robot. I mean, at that point, I'll just have a hanger or. Um, exactly. In life, I don't know. Uh, that's. Yeah. Yeah. Um, 
yeah, it also kind of dismisses, you know, the, the earlier point that I was speaking to about, um, what a model's personality mm -hmm. can bring to the table for a brand. Um, and that, that like for me, you know, entering the curb industry was like a huge, like revolutionary moment. Yeah. Um, you know, that these, these women not only had like curvier bodies, but they also had, you know, thoughts and opinions and, you know, were, um, were uh, big had big personalities um which which was like so alluring and so new and um exciting uh yeah well we'll see we'll see yeah we'll see we'll see but you know <laughs> Um, in the interim, that's, that's, that's largely why I'm, uh, whenever I've been asked, you know, if I'm coming back to the industry, what I'm doing after straight curve. Um, and I did do a few projects, but honestly, um, it's not to me. Um, and also, you know, aside from this, and I've had this conversation with a number of my agents as a white straight size woman who's approaching who, you know, in the next five years will be approaching middle age. Um, I don't really feel like there is a place for me or a demand for me as a model, um, especially in the U.S. right now. I mean, even, even in the U.K., I think you'd be, you'd be hard-pressed um, uh, because there's just, <laughs> it's like, it has been that aesthetic for so long that I think that all of these, these more diverse images of what women um, or people are, um, are kind of, you know, having, having a moment in the spotlight. So for mm -hmm. me to, you know, make a documentary like Straight Curve or even hold the, the values and the morals of a, you know, uh, you know, our society in general, I couldn't, you know, honestly go and work and be like, oh, I think that there needs to be another straight size white model. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, you know, maybe like, like I'd be interested if, if there was a space for me, maybe when I'm in like my late forties or my early fifties and, um, you know, wh wherever my body is at then. But right now I'm just kind of like, content to take a back seat if you will yeah um yeah and be up here farming <laughs> not to say i still not to say i don't still shoot because i definitely i definitely uh i definitely still get requests for shoots and do shoots but you know like like we said earlier these are creatives and um it's not something that's really um for profit it's like purely a creative outlet. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you so much for this contribution. Thank yeah. You. Thank you. Um, yeah, it's great. It's always great to, you know, reflect on the industry and try and forecast what's coming next. Um, but yeah, we'll see. We may look back on this like 10 years from now and you know be completely uh blindsided by another trend or another turn in the industry um yeah thank you so much for listening and please subscribe to the podcast if you haven't done so yet uh you can find green world in a pod on instagram for updates um, you can also find us on Facebook and Twitter. Um, please, if you listen to this and you got some thoughts or you want to share your experience, please do so. Screenshot and tag Green World in a pod. Um, message me directly. I 
always reply. <laughs> and I'll uh, see you next time.